This will change her mode ID. Whether it's for the better or for worse, only time will tell. This change can potentially make it cheaper for FPV pilots who want to comply, but also create a huge problem for FPV pilots who just want to ignore remote ID completely. This doesn't just affect FPV pilots in the USA, it also affects pilots in Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. The kicker is, this change to remote ID will not just affect DJI, but Cadex walks now, HD0, as well as Betaflight. There's also a giant incentive, as well as a giant stick, for companies like DJI, as well as manufacturers of pre-built drones, to force compliance with remote ID. That is, that the regulations actually require them to take steps to ensure that end users can't easily avoid compliance. Now, before we get into the weeds, the solution I propose is complete speculation. It doesn't mean it will or could ever happen like this, so please take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But before you cast me to the crazy corner, at least hear me out. Let's start with the current situation. Both the FAA and the EASA, who govern and regulate aviation in the USA and Europe, pass laws that require unmanned aerial systems or drones to have remote ID. Remote ID must broadcast telemetry about the drone's location and flight, but drones that you can buy from a store, they must also include the location of the pilot, known as the control station, in the remote ID broadcast. Currently, consumer drones like the DJI Avada have to comply with remote ID, and in fact, they do. The DJI Avada has an FAA-issued remote ID declaration of compliance, but this requirement also extends to the hobby-grade pre-built or bind-and-fly drones as well. Then come September 16, pilots have to comply with remote ID. For compliance to remote ID, there are three different scenarios in the regulations. Scenario one is standard remote ID, which are drones that you buy from the store. Module remote ID, which are the drones you build at home yourself. You then need to add a remote ID module. And number three is to operate without remote ID. And you can only do that when you're flying at a designated location known as a freer. Let's take a look at the DJI Avada, which is a standard remote ID drone. To fly an Avada, you either need to connect your smartphone to your DJI Goggles 2 to get a GPS location, or you can use the DJI Goggles Integra which have GPS built into them. That GPS location is then transmitted from the goggles to the Avada to include the control station or pilot's location in the Avada's remote ID broadcast. But how is the remote ID broadcast happening on the DJI Avada? Well, under the technical standards for remote ID, the remote ID broadcast module can actually use the telemetry data from the flight controller. The Avada also has a GPS unit, which provides the GPS data to the flight controller, which is subsequently sent to the broadcast module and then broadcast. So where is the broadcast module on the DJI Avada? Well, it's actually the DJI O3 Air unit that's in the Avada. Thanks to a firmware update, the O3 Air unit is now acting as a broadcast module. So how does this actually extend to Cadex Walksnail, HD0, and even Betaflight? Well, before I go into that, Let's start with the DJI O3 Air unit. See, for companies like iFlight, Gepassi, Diatone, Foxeer, and really anyone who sells a bind and fly or pre-built drone, they all fall under standard remote ID, and they need to sell those drones in compliance with remote ID regulations, which means they have to have a broadcast module that not only broadcasts the remote ID message, but includes the pilot's location in that broadcast. Now let's take a look at the iFlight Nazgul Evoke, which is a really popular pre-built or bind and fly drone. This comes with the option to have a GPS module pre-installed as well as the DJI O3 Air unit for your video feed. But iFlight need to comply with standard remote ID regulations, which means they're gonna need to have a broadcast module that knows the location of the control station or the pilot. Enter DJI with the O3 Air unit and the DJI goggles. Whether it's the Goggles 2 or the Goggles Integra, it really doesn't matter. Since the DJI O3 Air unit, which is on the Advada, is practically the same as the O3 Air unit that's on the iFlight Nazgul, and it's also the Air unit that's sold separately to be put on homemade FPV drones, there's now an easy way for companies like iFlight, who make and sell these pre-built drones, to easily comply with remote ID regulations. And they can do this without adding any extra components or cost to their product. And it's the same with pilots who already fly with DJI O3 if they want to comply with remote ID. All it takes is a firmware update from DJI and the O3 Air unit and any pre-built drone with an O3 Air unit is now compliant for standard remote ID. But this raises a few more questions. 
What about CAD Xbox now or HD0? Why not switch to them just to avoid this whole scenario? And how does Betaflight even come to this? And what about hobby FPV drones sold with an O3 air unit versus air units sold individually? How do you tell the difference? And what if you even wanted to just fly to Freer, which doesn't require you to have remote ID? Well, let's start with alternatives to DJI O3, such as the Walksnell Avatar HD system and HD0. Well, according to MadsTech, Cadex's Walksnell Avatar HD system would also be capable of becoming a remote ID broadcast module with a simple firmware update. As for HD0, I don't know if any of the current air units could be capable of becoming a broadcast module with a firmware update, but I do know HD0 are working on some new VTXs that may or may not have that capability. But let's say DJI went ahead and did this. Why would Cadex and HD0 want to follow in DJI's path? Why not separate yourself from them and do something different? Well, the thing is, they're all in business. See, pre-built drones are a major sales channel and revenue source. Plus, they need to be able to provide an easy solution for pilots who fly their systems to comply with remote ID if they want to. And being in business means there's also price when you're competing with someone. And one of the ways that both Cadex Walksnell and HD0 compete with DJI is on price. That being that their ecosystem overall is cheaper than DJI O3. So let's say you work for Cadex and your job is to sell a video system to GEPRC who make pre-built drones like the GEPRC Mark V. You see, GEPRC sells the DJI O3 version for $587, while the Cadex Walksnell version is $499. But if GEPRC now had to include a separate broadcast module on the CADEX Walksnail version to make sure that GEPRC were compliant under the regulations, they'd likely have to increase the price to somewhere around $550. This is before we even factor in the friction and ease for the CADEX Walksnail version to not only have the pilot's location sent from the goggles to the VTX, but then from the VTX to a separate broadcast module so GEPRC could be compliant. So someone like Cadex Walksnell is going to have to follow suit with DJI anyway, because not only is it the simplest solution, it's a solution that doesn't impact a major sales channel, therefore revenue. Not to mention it's the easiest way to give their user base who want to comply with the ability to comply. Now we end up in the situation where not only do we have pre-built drones that need to comply with standard remote ID, but we also have module remote ID for homemade drones. Now, since DJI and Cadex Walksnail sell their air units to companies who make pre-built drones, as well as individual pilots like you and I who build and fly, they're going to need to comply with two different sets of remote ID regulations, standard and module. This creates another major problem. In order to prevent the regulations from standard remote ID creeping into module remote ID, where the location of the pilot is broadcast with module remote ID, which it's not required to, the logical answer seems that to solve this problem, they're going to need to maintain two branches of firmware. One branch for air units which go on pre-built drones, and one branch for air units which go on home-built drones. And to an extent, DJI does this already with the O3 air unit. There's one branch for the Avada, one branch for individual air units, so DJI are probably going to end up with a third branch anyway. And there's also a catch. You see, the regulations require companies who make broadcast modules to make sure they're tamper-proof, and to also incorporate, wait for it, additional functions, methods, or techniques to prevent tampering by end users. So this requirement could simply put a stop to you flashing the DIY firmware to an air unit when you set it up. So manufacturers will probably end up having minor variations in the bootloader of each device to prevent the wrong firmware, such as module remote ID firmware, being flashed to a standard remote ID VTX. But these tamper-proof requirements also extend to ensuring that the telemetry and GPS data that goes into the broadcast module hasn't been tampered with in the first place. And this could put implications on Betaflight to assist pre-built drone manufacturers with complying with tamper-proof regulations. One of the things working in Betaflight's favor in order to avoid getting caught up in the complexity of standard versus module remote ID and pissing every pilot off in the process is that it's an open source project. So let's look at how Betaflight could implement both module remote ID for pilots of home-built drones who want to comply with remote ID, but also how they could help manufacturers who need to comply with standard remote ID. First, let's say these digital video systems turn into broadcast modules. Well, they all connect to Betaflight through MSP. And Betaflight already have the ability to send telemetry data through any of the different serial ports 
your flight controller. So they could simply develop a remote ID telemetry output option that when enabled would include all the necessary information for remote ID to be sent over MSP to that broadcast module. But standard remote ID would also be a huge issue for Betaflight. You see, the tamper-proof requirements could mean that Betaflight simply just going to let you turn it off. Then you've tampered with it. We don't want Betaflight to end up in the firing line from the US government. Now, being an open source project also is their saving grace that allows Betaflight to keep everyone happy. Yes, individual pilots who wanted to comply, individual pilots who wanted to ignore remote ID completely, and manufacturers of pre-built drones that didn't have a choice. So how would Betaflight actually do it? Well, they wouldn't. See, Betaflight wouldn't need to do anything except ensure that the functionality existed inside of the master branch of Betaflight for it to be able to send remote ID data to a broadcast module. Then companies like iFlight, who make the pre-built drones, can simply fork Betaflight. If you aren't familiar with a fork, well, imagine you're going somewhere and there's the main highway, but there's also a scenic route. The fork is taking the scenic route without affecting the main highway and you still get to the same destination. Well, at least in this instance of a fork, you would. So manufacturers of a pre-built drone can simply just fork Betaflight and in that fork, remove the ability for remote ID to be turned off or tampered with. And then you put this fork on the firmware of the pre-built drones. They'd still have to solve for tampering though, such as just flashing the main version of Betaflight to your pre-built drone. So having a different firmware target for their fork, even though the flight controller is practically the same, can be classed as a function, method or technique to prevent tampering. The last remaining thing is what occurs if the air unit, which is now also a broadcast module, doesn't have valid remote ID data in the flight controller, such as if you're flying at a Freer, which actually doesn't require you to have remote ID. Well, the easiest solution would be to connect your smartphone to your goggles to provide your takeoff location. And through an app on your smartphone, that would identify that you're actually in a Freer, and then the goggles would just display the video feed and you'd be good to go and fly. And this same kind of geofencing actually exists in Mavics, so it's not out of the realm of possibilities to extend it into FPV drones. And now we've pretty much got everything sorted as to how this whole clusterfuck of remote ID can be solved while keeping everyone happy. And sure, there's still a lot of edge cases that need to be worked through. Like, what if you want to ignore remote ID completely? Well, the way the laws are written is you're not supposed to. So things like jailbreaks to the geofencing that are on Mavics you're probably going to have similar kinds of jailbreaks brought out for FPV drones. And if you're someone who doesn't want to comply with remote ID, you're going to have to learn how to build a pre-built drone anyway. So why don't you watch this video here to find out how. I'm Darren Ella. Until next time, don't forget to send it.